Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Hear Our Voices. We have a special guest today. Her name is Allie, and she's going to tell you her story about her experience. So we're just going to dive right into it. So can you tell us a little bit how you got into shelter? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Allie. So the way it started out was um, we were living in an apartment in New York City um, owned by NYCHA. Our apartment was uninhabitable. There were several issues. And the final straw for us, which is what led us to leave, is that our bedroom ceiling actually collapsed on top of me and my son, Jay, in the middle of the night. And, and we did not receive any emergency services from, from the housing authority or from any other um, emergency services until we were notified by a friend of mine to go to PATH. And then I was entered into shelter. Oh my gosh. That yeah. is so scary. I'm sorry that happened to you. Oh yeah, my it was gosh. very scary. What was worse was that nobody was assisting us. You know, the landlord didn't seem to care. Nobody who was involved with NYCHA seemed to care or be able to help. Um, it was just a complete nightmare. Did you end up doing something about it after or you just let it slide? No, we we are currently, we have a pending lawsuit. Um, it's, there's a lot, you know, to it because when we first entered into the shelter, we technically were not considered to be quote unquote homeless yeah. because we did technically have that apartment. And so even the shelter did not want to give us services. They were trying to make us go back to our apartment. You know, they're wow. saying to us, well, you're not homeless. You need to go back home. You have an apartment. You're not homeless. And I'm saying, well, listen, this apartment is uninhabitable. This is a, a dangerous situation. Nobody in their right mind would go back to a place where they don't feel safe, where they feel like, you know, the ceiling could collapse again. Yeah. And even when the carpenter came at this time, I was not staying there anymore. I mean, I, I still had possession of the apartment for about nine months. So the nine months that I was in the shelter, I technically still had access to my apartment. Nobody told me to leave. I left on my own because I didn't feel it was safe there. Right. And there was a big hole in my ceiling and everything in our bedroom was completely destroyed. Our beds, our, our clothing, like there was no, not like we could just go back there and just go back to sleep like nothing happened, you know? Oh my so, gosh. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was a whole thing. And, and even the shelter staff and the people there who were supposed to help you were just like, basically you need to leave because you're not homeless. And so it was definitely a struggle trying to get services and trying to basically, um, basically trying to just get people to acknowledge like where you're standing, you know, in that kind of situation, like, you know, it's, I don't think anybody in their right mind would uh, say, okay, whatever, I'm just going to go back home. I'll wait for them to come fix it. And then I'll just like, like nothing happened, you know? NYCHA is a piece of work. I live in NYCHA now. And yeah. I grew up in Queens in like a regular house, never grew up in like no buildings or anything. So I don't know how it is, but the water last night literally came off. I came home and the water was off. I'm like, again, I literally, because mm -hmm. I've been here since 2008. The water has gone off ever since every year since I've been here a couple of times a year, right? So yeah. I make sure I have like an emergency bottle just in case I come home and have to wash my hands or do something, you know? <sighs> Who has to live like that? It's, exactly. Live it's, like that? it's ridiculous that you need to have like these emergency steps in place for not knowing what's going to happen when at the very least they could inform you, okay, we're going to be doing some kind of services or something. The water's going to be off. Sometimes they do let you know, but sometimes they don't. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's not fair. It's not right. And that's just one small snippet of the kind of stuff that NYCHA does. And they just don't seem to care. They don't seem to think that these things matter. And they do matter. They're very important. People's health, people's lives, people's mental health is affected by, by these things that they overlook. Right. It's so true. Like, I'm just not used to the environment. <laughs> what they get. Yeah. It's Nobody so is. I don't think anybody can get used to it. I think some people who are, who like, they grew up here generations, I think they get used to it. That's all they know. When you're a person who moves yeah. in from outside and comes in, you're like, this is not right. I think that's what it is. Yeah. So that's what I, it seems to me. Because people who have been here, like, I know people on my floor or whatever, who's been there all their life and they're used to this how this life is going because their, their mother is here their grandmother is here their auntie live on a different floor like you know there's a whole yeah. generation of people living in the system they don't even realize like people shouldn't be living like cats and dogs <laughs> like in exactly. apartments you shouldn't be treated like that you should have heat I had to buy a heater this year because only one part is either I have no heat or only one I have one bedroom apartment it's either the bathroom only has heat and it can't heat up the whole apartment or my daughter yeah. doesn't have heat 
That's what you're going to do in apartments. Or sometimes there's too much heat when it's hot out, when you don't even need the heat. To exactly. Be so they'll have the heat on until like May. And it'll be like 70 degrees out. And then they have the heat on. It doesn't make any sense. It's, I don't know. Something yeah. is just definitely broken in the system. I don't know why they just can't fix it. I feel like it's an easy fix. It's just, I just, I just don't know. I really don't know. Yeah. What the problem with them. I know. It's out of nobody seems to be able to figure it out because there's just ongoing issues with everything that they have going on right so I made sure I got a water like dispenser but I was like I, I don't know where I gotta cut my water and I used to boil water before or just buy yeah. a bottle of water I just got a dispenser I was like you could deliver the water to my house <laughs> every month yeah. and and I know that I have drinking water at least like if I don't have regular yeah. running water I at least have drinking water because you need water yeah. like you don't know how long it's gonna be out and, and that's another thing <laughs> And another thing, like feeling like you have to purchase water. Why do we have to purchase water? Like it doesn't make any sense. We're supposed to be having access to clean drinking water and right. we don't even feel comfortable enough to drink your water because, you know, because you think it may not be clean enough or other issues. That's not right either. Why should we have to pay for water? I don't understand it because we have to do that too. When I was living there, I paid for, although I felt that my water was clean enough, I still had like several filters and I had a zero filter, which is supposed to be very good. But yeah. um, even then, so, you know, we just, we buy water because we don't feel it's, we just don't feel comfortable drinking tap water. Yeah. Honestly, I grew up not drinking tap water out the faucet like that. And I grew up in my neighborhood, yeah. like I grew up in Queens and Laurelton and they have good water. But my mother, my family's from Jamaica. We are just normally boiling our water anyway. We feel like, it yeah. out, you know, the bacteria and stuff. Yeah. So stuff like that. Or are just drinking bottled water. So I don't, I mind yeah. buying because it's a cost, it's like 20 something dollars a month. But yeah. um, make sure my water is hopefully good for me to drink. I just yeah, just buy it and keep same, it the same with us. Yeah, I used to filter thing. too when I moved in. It was a lot. Yeah, we grew up too with like boiling water or buying water. We were never it was never a thing for us to drink tap water. And even still, when I see people doing it, I find it to be odd. I just don't understand how people are just totally fine with it. Like. Yeah. you know and, and especially within you know within certain places like NYCHA but even like within the shelter I absolutely would not have been drinking that water because that building was so old and there were constant um plumbing issues there's just no way I could trust the water right definitely so as you said let's go let's get into the, the nitty-gritty why we're really here right so yes. can you tell me the process of when you got into the path how did you hear about it and why did you pick this particular way to get into shelter? Okay, so initially when the when the bedroom ceiling collapsed, this happened on um on a winter morning. It was like two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, when it happened, we were obviously in bed sleeping. You know, it was a weekday, it was a Tuesday. And um, my son had school the next day, and I, I don't remember what I had to do, but you know, I had regular regular things I had to do on that day. And when it happened, we were greeted by a NYCHA worker at the emergency room, right? Um, when we got there, he told us, he informed us that he'd contacted Red Cross and that they were going to come to the apartment to assess the damages and then put us in an emergency hotel. And then from there that we would discuss um, with, with the landlord from that particular building, because this was, even though it was owned by NYCHA, um, it was, I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, it was something that they had purchased and then became a NYCHA property. It wasn't like a big project buildings like you usually see. It was like okay. a small building that they took on. And, and as I understand, they renovated it and then they took it on as their own, but it wasn't initially. As I understand, I maybe um, I, this is what I've heard from some neighbors. I don't know if it's 100% true or not. I just know it's not the big giant uh, buildings that you normally see. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, when, when we contacted the Red Cross, they had no record of being contacted. They had no record of any of the information that I was telling them about my ceiling, this and that. So for two days, you know, from the time, so we went to emergency, you know, we went through all that. So after that, I'm contacting the landlord. What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? He goes, I said, I have no beds to sleep in. My beds are completely that. He tells me, he, I, he told, told me, you can buy a mattress and request a reimbursement. What? Is what he told me. Yeah, he said you can oh buy a mattress God. and request the room. Like I was just gonna buy a mattress and just put it in that bedroom <laughs> under this big giant hole, right. <laughs> under this giant hole above my head, and just like like nothing happened. Like I couldn't believe it. So we received absolutely no help, no assistance from from NYCHA. Anyway, so then when, when like after that happened, I didn't know where to go, where to stay. So I stood with my sister for a couple of days. I got a few clothing items, and she also lives 
she lives in Harlem River Houses, which I understand like maybe one of the older projects in New York City. Yeah. So there are a lot of issues with her apartment too. And from that very first night of me staying in her apartment, I already had post-traumatic stress disorder that same night. That same night I was already experiencing um, PTSD. Um, her heater, like you were mentioning about heater issues, would make these loud, loud noises. Yeah. And the banging of the, it, it, I, you know, it, it's unbelievable. It sounds like someone is doing it. Like someone is like taking, I know what you mean. <laughs> and, but it's, it's just like a normal noise apparently. And it would just bang so loud. Sometimes it would be such a strong bang that you would actually feel some vibration from it. Oh, wow. So I stood at her place for a couple of nights, um, you know, while going back and forth to calling different people, talking to different agencies, you know, trying to get some kind of help, some kind of assistance trying to get at least an expedited transfer, you know, from my apartment to, because we were already trying to get a transfer for several um, months before this even happened because I was due for a two bedroom. I only had a one bedroom at the time, but they were I, also- I'm sorry, can I stop you for a minute? How okay. old, you have a son, right? He was nine at the time. That's, and they gave you one bedroom? Well, we, when we first moved there, he was a baby and I had a one bedroom and then I was due for a transfer after he was five. And since then I had been trying to get a transfer, but- you know, it, apparently there was this new thing that they don't have to give you a transfer unless it's an emergency, like they don't have to expedite it. I don't know if that's true or not, but they were like not trying to give me a transfer. They were, sometimes they even refused to even give me the paperwork. They finally did shortly after this incident actually um, happened. Like, oh, I think it was, was it after or before, but it was like around that time. So like they only finally gave it to me you know, later when my son was nine, when I think if I'm not mistaken, you can get a transfer when your child is five. Like if you have an opposite sex child from you, then you can get another room. That's so, I've, I was told so much different information. Exactly. I've, so that's why when I keep saying like, I'm not sure because it's-, no, it's I, know what you, I know you're saying, but it's weird yeah. to me that you got a one bedroom and you have a son. They told me when I move in, because my daughter is a girl, yeah. that I can only get a one bedroom apartment until she's six. So they told me if I had a boy, I would have got a two-bedroom apartment. That was in line to everybody. They don't, we don't know so the that, right rules. So yeah. Wow. So maybe, maybe I was supposed to have a two-bedroom already, but I just, I didn't. I don't know why. But anyway, so, so then moving on. So we, we, um, so I'm with my sister. I've already have PTSD. At that point, um, we didn't know where to go. I'm calling people. I'm going to the state uh, to be able to help. You know, I'm going back and forth to different court places and, and trying to get some sort of legal assistance. And then my friend, a random friend who hadn't called me in a while, calls me. She's like, hey, how are you doing this and that? And I told her, you're not going to believe what happened. A couple of days ago, my bedroom ceiling collapsed on me. I've been saying my sister the past few days. I don't um, know what to do. She goes, oh, my God. She goes, you got to go to PATH. I'm like, what's PATH? And I don't know the act. I don't know what that acronym stands for. Path, um, if it is an acronym for something else, but it's basically a place where you go if you're homeless or if you're experiencing homelessness, and they help you in placing you into a more. Um, it would be a a temporary shelter, but then the shelter itself would assist you with getting permanent housing, as I understand. So I went to Path. I went there. Um, it and it's like when you go there, it's just like you just feel horrible being there because everybody looks distressed. The staff, you know, like the right. security and the staff, they're not friendly. They're, they look through your bags and they, they kind of almost treat you like, it almost feels like you're going into jail or something, right. into some sort of prison. <laughs> and they take things away from you that you're not allowed to have, um, whatever. It could be any random thing, like a little bottle opener on your keychain or something like that they'll take from you. Um, so, and then also, you can't bring your pet. So I also had a dog at the time, which I had no idea what to do. Thank goodness my friend offered to take him with her to Long Island and my rabbit too, which I had at the time as well. So anyway, we go there. We finally get um, help from PATH and they place us in a um, family residence, which is on the Upper West Side. And then when we got there, it was like the start of another nightmare. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you could change one of the process through the whole ordeal what would you change about the process oh my gosh one thing all right um, I'll give you two things two things I just think that well first of all the whole the path like from the very beginning when you get into path I told you it's like going into prison there's um security scanners there there are um like these machines you know when you put like in the airport that you put yeah. your badge um 
you know, I understand they want to keep everybody safe, but when you're thinking about it, these people who are going there, most of them are fleeing for their lives, you know, from domestic violence or something happened, you know, in their apartment, like in my case, where the bedroom ceiling collapsed or they couldn't pay their rent because maybe they lost their job and, and then it, it caused a domino effect where they, you know, weren't able to keep up with rent. Everybody's there for a different reason. But the bottom line is that everybody's there because they just had a traumatic experience happen right. to them, you know, and it's affecting their lives. It's, it's affecting the lives of their families. And it doesn't seem like, the staff or the security or any of the people who are working in these jobs are acknowledging that like they they're just treating you like like you're just like you've done something wrong like you know right. like you've done something wrong and now and now you're coming begging for help after you've done something wrong you know that's the way it feels and it's just like it's bizarre because they they have no compassion they have no empathy they don't seem to uh care at all about helping other people it just seems like they're just there because it's just their job and I know that these kinds of jobs can get stressful and they can be very draining but um this is this is kind of the time when you got to just put on a, a smile and and say hi I hope you're doing well you know welcome and we're here to help you know and just let people know that that you are there to help them that you want to help them and that they're going to receive the services they need and they're not going to be judged as if they've done something wrong if they as if they deserve you know to be there right I know what you mean I definitely know so that's like the that's like the main thing like honestly and not just within the past but then when you go on to the shelter as well it's the same kind of demeanor with the workers like they just they're rude they're disrespectful they treat you like you're a piece of garbage like you know it, it, does, it feels like you're in prison and they're the wardens is what it feels like it does it does definitely feel like that. And it's sad. Um, did your shelter have metal detectors too? Or it was just like, you get no. to walk in and be free? It was a family residence. So they did not have metal detectors. They did not check us when we came in. However, they did do room checks. So they would check our rooms for um, whatever, you know, we weren't, there were a lot of things we weren't allowed to have. Um, so, but still, it, even though they didn't check us when we came in, there was always security there in the front, a lot of security. And um, it just always felt like, you know, like you're just walking into a jail. The door would be locked, the front door. So you'd have to get buzzed in. And sometimes they would be chit-chatting among each other, amongst themselves. So then you would have to wait in order for them to buzz you in if they weren't like paying attention to the door that you were there, you know? And, and sometimes if you came at night, because that neighborhood, there happened to be a lot of like, you know, there were some other characters in the neighborhood that weren't, you know, probably people you want to encounter in the night. So sometimes <laughs> if we came in like late, not even that late, you yeah. would have to stand outside and sometimes deal with harassment from people in the neighborhood before we were buzzed in. That would happen once in a while. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Of all the shelters in New York don't have metal detectors, but some of them do. I went to four and the last one I was in had them. So I had to do it every single day with my daughter. It's it's ridiculous. Wow. I understand how you feel. Um, but I was used to it a little bit just because I went to a high school that had it. So I was used yeah. to it for four years in high school. <laughs> they coming over. It's so yeah. sad that we have to go through these things that really, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's horrible. You always feel yeah, like children, you know, people watching. Children you. Shouldn't, yeah, children shouldn't have to deal with this kind of stuff. They're children. They're innocent. They should not be treated as if they're criminals you know come on yeah. a five-year-old six seven-year-old nine-year-old child like why would they why should they be walking through metal detectors it's just right. not right it's and it's putting this thing in their mind that you know that they gotta like make sure that people view them as being good as doing what's right as you know because maybe they feel people are viewing them that maybe they're not good and they need to prove themselves that they are you know it's not right right so tell me how was it with you and the workers and how was your room at the shelter when you finally got there? How did they greet you? How was the intake process for you? Did they explain everything to you? Things like that. Um, so yeah, they did a little, when we first got in, um, it was late when we got in. When we were in PATH, they told us that we were waiting for a van to come pick us up and take us. And it was already like nine o'clock at this point. And I'm like, so when is this van? And they couldn't tell me anything. They couldn't tell me right. what time. They couldn't tell me how many hours. I'm like, well, it's nine o'clock now. The guy's like, it could be a couple of hours. I'm like, a couple of hours. Path is in in the South Bronx area, right? right. And uh, and um, this shelter that we were assigned to was on the Upper West Side. 
And I'm sitting up there, I'm like, well, I can get there in 30 minutes, you know? And I'm just like, I'm not going to wait. And I asked, I said, well, can I just go there on my own? Because I, I'm, I'm tired, you know? Like, I don't want to wait for, um, I was exhausted. I had an exhausting week, you know? I didn't want to wait for, um, for some van to come and who knows when, you know, by the time it shows up, it could have been two hours past when I could have been there already, you know? So yeah. they said it was fine, but I could go. So they gave me my paperwork. I went to the shelter myself. I got there around maybe nine something. Hold on. Got in. Before you go on, did they give you the Metro cards? Uh, don't remember. They may have. I don't remember that. Okay. It, so they're supposed yeah. to give you Metro cards if you're, they leave, if you're leaving by yourself. But continue. Yeah. So yeah, I don't remember. So I just know that I did finally arrive. It was hard to find the address, but I found it eventually. So when we got there, the person who was supposed to actually do this intake went. She left like for a break so then we were kind of waiting and waiting and then finally some other lady who's just a regular security guard she's not like the supervisor she went and took us upstairs and she did everything what she took us and she showed us you know the refrigerator and everything was okay it was a very very tiny room with a bump bed um it has a kitchenette which is basically two burners with one little small sink and it has its own private little bathroom regular little bathroom um, and a regular size fridge. There was no dresser. There was a little round table with two chairs. Um, there was a closet in the room, a small closet um, that was like, you know, in the room. Cause apparently this was an old hotel that had been converted into a uh, homeless shelter. Yeah. So we didn't have a dresser. So we go there, um, you know, we, we finally get settled in. And then a few days later, I've realized that the stove, when you turn it on, it starts to uh, smell very strongly like gas, so strong that the smell actually had gone out to the hallway and we were told not to use the stove because of this reason, Wow! right? And yeah, so then we're like, okay, well, if we can't use the stove, we're not allowed to have a microwave. They did have food downstairs, but my son and I were vegan um, and we're, we're more vegan at the time. And we didn't really eat that food. We ate some of it. Sometimes we try to pick, like if there were some vegetables, we just try to eat some parts of the dish that was available. They had frozen meals downstairs and a microwave. And um, we were also told that there was a washer um, machine or laundry area in the shelter, which was not true. And we were also told that there was a, a media area where you could use a computer if you needed, which was also not true. Um, so we weren't told by, um, by the shelter staff, we were told by PATH on the information that Pat gave us, the paperwork, it stated that, that information on the paperwork. Um, so yeah, so I would ask for a dresser. Um, we never, ever got one. They, they eventually brought in something, but it was literally, it wasn't a dresser. What it was is like those little tiny dresser things you have at the end of your bed that has two little oh, drawers, like little nightstand. Yeah. Like a little nightstand. And they brought something like that and it was small and it had three little like small drawers. And it was not a dresser. Like, that's not a dresser. That's a, that's like a little junk drawer. You know, that's not something where yeah. you actually put. So we <laughs> never got a dresser the whole time that we were there. Um, we constantly um, mentioned about the, the, the um, stove not working. They kept coming up as if it could be fixed. The super from the building told me, well, you know, it's an old it's building. I don't know what to tell you, mama. <laughs> and then wow. he goes and then yeah and then he goes we're gonna be we're gonna be moving taking all of these out and putting in new stuff but it's gonna take time I'm like well then none of this information helps me like at all exactly so we, had, so we had to get like a letter from the case manager or our case worker to um sent to the HRA so that they could give us like extra benefits because we had to buy um outside food because we weren't able to cook indoors um, you know, and, uh, and of course, a lot of people broke the rules and they had, um, little ovens and they had little microwaves and they had little, uh, stoves too sometimes, because I think other people also had those issues and some people weren't allowed to use the stove, um, because they didn't, um, actually some people didn't have a stove in their room because some people didn't have gas, like some lines were on a gas line. I don't know. There was some confusion at some point. They even told my son and I that we weren't able to use the food in the downstairs because that food is only for people who don't have stoves. And I'm saying to them, well, everybody's aware that my stove doesn't work. I've made several complaint tickets. Everybody knows that. And now all of a sudden you guys are saying this, like, you know, so it was always like, there was always like some sort of battle with them. Yeah. Like about everything. There were several times where my uh, refrigerator will also stop working, especially in the summer months, because I guess the humidity, I don't know, but sometimes it would stop and sometimes it would start working again. It was just crazy. I, I told this to them at least three different times. They never changed my refrigerator. They never even came to look at my refrigerator. Um, so there were just ongoing um, 
things. Thank goodness we never had a, um, a rodent issue or, or, um, or anything like with roaches or anything like that. But other people complained a lot that they had mice. And then eventually we got a cat. So that was definitely going to deter any mice. And that was an issue at some point. At some point they lied and they said that I had two black cats. I said, no, I only have one gray cat, which you guys know about. And the guy's like, no, you hit him. You, and I just like, I'm just like, wait, why am I, why would I hide him? Why would I lie? I know you guys can come into my room at any point. Like, you know, it was just this constant, like weird situation with them. And then at some point I went down to see my caseworker. Um, she was a new worker because I had a different worker. And then it, my worker also changed like three or four times that I was there. So that yeah. was very annoying too. always having yeah. to have a new worker. So this one worker, the last one, she actually, one day I went and I asked her, I told her I needed a residency letter. I believe I needed it for HRA because you need to constantly bring proof of like your address. Yeah. And when I asked her for it, she told me, she said, oh, it's cute that you come to me when you need something. It's cute. Like, <laughs> like I was a puppy or something. Like I'm thinking, wait a minute, she's my worker. Isn't that what I'm supposed to go to her? Exactly. For that or something? And I just couldn't believe that of how rude and disrespectful she was. And so then I went to her manager and I told him, I said, I'm never going to interact with her again. So she better not ever speak to me. Um, um, I don't have to interact with her if I don't want to. And I'm not going to. And then from then on, I only, um, you know, every time I had some sort of issue or whatever, or meetings, it was always with him. I never interacted with her. Um, I, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Like that sort of behavior, that sort of commentary. Why say something like that? You know, when, in what context would you ever have to talk to somebody like that? You exactly. know? And so especially a person who you are supposed to be helping, her job is, that is her job to help me, you know, to help me with documents that I may need. And if I come to, you, to the person who's supposed to help me asking for help, well, I don't understand how they think that it's okay to say, oh, it's real cute. Like, it was like, it was as if she took it, she'd taken it personally that there were a few times that we had a meeting and I had missed it because I either had a doctor's appointment or I had physical therapy but she like took it personally. Like, no, it's not a personal thing. Like, first of all, you work with me, you know, your job is to help me with whatever I need help with in, in you know, in terms of like this situation that I'm in. So nothing is personal. Why are you taking it personally? And that's what it felt like. It felt like she had taken that person. She goes, Oh, it's cute that you come for, to me for help. I was like, I couldn't even believe that. I was like, what? Like, so, I, you know, that was the, the kind of demeanor and the kind of behavior that a lot of people there, um, that's just kind of what they did like the security was like that like just like rude disrespectful like very like um condescending you know um other staff members were like that too and then they would also try to almost make people feel like when they came to like housing like actually trying to find housing they they would want to push you know because they want to get people out I understand they're doing that's their job they want to do their job but they it felt like they were trying to push people into situations they didn't want to be in like they were trying to force everybody to sign up for NYCHA, which some people don't want. And I especially didn't want it because obviously I just come from there and it was a nightmare and I wasn't going to go back to that. Um, I wasn't going to go back to any NYCHA building because it's not, it wasn't just my building. It, I mean, that's an ongoing thing throughout the New York City housing yeah. building that their buildings are falling apart. They're not keeping up with, with maintenance. And, and this is just an ongoing thing. So I'm not going to go back to that kind of life, you know, to have to worry again about what's going to happen next, you know, what's going to fall next or what's going to break next. So I didn't want that. But when you, when you don't want certain things, they, they try to make you feel as if you don't want to leave the shelter bad enough. It's like, listen, I, I want to leave the shelter, but I'm not trying to go back into the situation I was in before and then end up in a shelter again, or end up hurt, you know, or God forbid, you know, something else or something else happens. And I don't want to go live in a neighborhood that I don't want to live in bottom line. You ain't going to go and go somewhere. And then the first thing you're thinking is, oh, when am I going to get out of here? I can't wait to get out. You know, you want to go, yeah. especially after after shelter, you want to go somewhere where you can at least stay for a while, you know, right? and relax, settle down for a while. You know, the first thing you're, you're not, the first thing you sh you, you're not going to be thinking is, oh, when am I, I got to move. I got to get out of here. Yeah, that's you know? what I'm doing. <laughs> that's, that's not like, that shouldn't be your first thought. Your first thought should be, ah, I get to relax. I get to get settled in later. And then maybe in a few years, if I want to move, I'll consider it then. But like, who's going to want to move right away? I mean, at least that's not what I would want. And I really yeah. don't think that people would want that, especially after being in a shelter for or for three years. And then who knows 
how long, you know, being in whatever situation led them to being in a shelter, you know? Right. Understandable, understandable. How long were you in a shelter? I was there for nearly three years. Three like, years. Yeah, okay. yeah, nearly. That's a long time. Because the average family, they say, stay over a year. So in the same shelter or did you go to different shelters? Uh, fortunately, we were able to remain in the same shelter. Um, I knew of other families there that some of them had been there for five years or six years. And oh I'm like, how God. is this? How? Like there are families that, that when I got there, they were already there before me. And when I left, they were still there and they're still there basically now. And I don't understand how is it that, I mean, everybody has a different situation, but I don't yeah. get that. I don't understand how, what's going on, how they're working these things out, how they're um, deciding who gets you know, to move, like, I don't know, understand how they're allocating these, these uh, resources, you know, yeah. I don't know. That's crazy. Yeah. I could say for sure, I know people who work with like the, um, who work with some people in the shelter, some families want to stay there long enough to, to actually save up money. And because yeah. it's like, it's, it's cheaper by staying in a shelter. But to me, yeah. I feel like I would want my own space and my own spot. Yeah. And I have to be under, like, I feel like somebody's eye, their thumb. It's like, yeah, yeah you kind of, you can't move like yourself because yeah. it's restricting you on how you can live your life. It's really, it's kind of scary. It really, is. <laughs> it really is. It's it's basically like what, what it felt like being in a shelter. It felt like my life was on pause. It felt like, like a piece of my life and my son's life was taken away from me for that time because we were not able to do many things I mean I tried my best to keep things normal for him to keep him entertained to do fun things with him as much as I could um you know to my abilities but it still did affect us it still affected the things that we wouldn't do you know we couldn't stay out like overnight like you could right. stay out I think for no more than 48 hours um and, you know, and if you did want to stay out longer, you needed a special pass, you needed special permission, you, they needed to know where you were going, they wanted an address, they wanted all this stuff. And I'm like, well, what's the problem if you're going to stay out for, let's say, uh, one week, right, one time, and they said, well, if you can stay somewhere for a week, that means you're not homeless. It's like, just because you yeah. could stay somewhere, like, even if, let's say your family had some sort of event, and you went to stay with your family for one week, that doesn't mean you can live with your family. That doesn't mean exactly. that they're going to allow you to live with them. So for them to say, oh, well, if you have, if you could stay somewhere for a week, that means that you could live there if you needed to. That's, that's completely irrational to even say that. And untrue. And they know that they know that that is completely um, untrue, you know, and, and unreasonable to say something like that, because everybody knows that you can't just, you know, just because someone's willing to let you stay in their place for a couple of days or even up to a week or so, or even a couple of weeks, doesn't mean that they're going to be okay with you staying there or are able to host you for you know a year plus you and your child or your children right so so for them to kind of like make those kinds of assumptions and say those kinds of things like oh well you know if you can stay somewhere for whatever amount of time then that means you don't need to be in the shelter so they'll, they'll literally kick you out they will what they will do if you stay out for more than two days they will log you out that was Ali's story guys please come back next week to hear the rest of her story is really interesting really juicy as you can hear guys if you don't know we have a new twitter page h-o-v-n-y-c at twitter we also have an instagram but everything will be definitely in the description down below if i quoted anything wrong thank you for coming out thank you for listening to us later